Hi, my name is Tracy Takahama Espinosa, and this is a video on Module 2 of Mind, Brain, and Now, where we're going to be looking at learners' productive courses of action. So in this particular video, we're going to be considering academic competence as well as growth mindsets. We'll be looking at this from a mind, brain, health, and education perspective by considering how learning is for life, a lifelong process. And we'll do this through the vision of formal learning as well as informal learning contexts. Then we're going to complement that with the uh, understanding of growth mindsets. So to begin, what's really important is to basically understand how does the brain learn anything in the whole world. And number one, number one, you have to pay attention. You're perceiving your world around you. And you do this through your senses. You sense your world through all of your different three modalities. You see things, smell things, hear things, taste things. And that signal then travels up through your brainstem, base of the brain, and the very first stop it makes is within different memory hubs. So concretely, there's a first stop at the amygdala to see if there's any emotional memory, anything that they should be worried about, um, anything that would preserve the body, basically. And then less than a split second later, it goes frontal lobe and back to the hippocampus for a confirmation of that information. So we'll see that from the very get-go, the main ideas, the two key pillars of all learning are attention and memory, which is mediated by sensory perception, what you perceive about your world or what you can remember that you perceived about your world. Once you have that sensory input, in order for that to become learning or a kind of a memory in the brain, to create synapses, connections between different parts of the brain, most learning does not occur immediately instantaneously just after a single exposure. You really do need to have several rehearsals of that information in order to create that synapse. Synapses are created electrically and chemically. Basically, usually it's an electrical signal that triggers release or inhibition of certain chemicals that will create the possibility of the, or the potential for that synapse to occur, that link between the different parts of the brain. And if it's rehearsed over time, then you get what's called a strengthening of the myelin sheath. And that's basically the white matter in your brain, which are glial cells, which will coat that synaptic connection, which increases the speed. This is why if you've rehearsed something over and over again, for example, uh, driving a car. Initially, you were very slow and it took a long time. It was heavy cognitive load, a lot of energy to do something. But once it's been rehearsed over time, you have a lot of these glial cells, this white matter, which speeds up the connections so that you're able to retrieve those memories much quicker. But the most important element to consider is that in order to really prove that somebody has learned something, is that they're able to recall it, they can use it, apply it, and basically transfer it to new contexts. So globally, how does the brain learn? You pay attention, you have sensory experiences, you check with memory systems to see if something already exists there. In order to create a new memory, you have to have a certain amount of rehearsal in order to speed up the retrieval of that information and then be able to apply that new knowledge, skill, or attitude in a new context. So once we have this basic concept understood how the brain learns, we have this very big question that's in front of us. There is such a thing as ages, the age of a person, the chronological age, are you 1, 2, 50, 60 years old? The stages, these are cognitive stages of development that, that occur from a psychological perspective. And then there's prior experiences. So here's a big question for you. What plays a bigger role or what is more indicative of potential to learn? Your age? your stage, or your prior experiences. It might surprise you to learn that prior experiences are definitely the most important indicator of your potential to learn something new. What you already know influences what you can know. And the least important of all of these things is actually your chronological age. Um, this is why some people, um, some small kids, for example, who've been exposed, have had a lot of prior experience, with reading materials are really prepared and ready to go and able to learn to read maybe at three or four years old. Whereas other people might be seven, eight or nine and just because of the lack of prior experiences are not able to do the same task. So we know the prior experiences definitely outweigh your chronological age when it comes down to being an indicator for what you're able to learn. This then begs the question, you know, how should learning be designed uh, in our schools? Uh, why, why do we divide kids by their ages, for example, rather than their prior experiences? Big question here. 
And the importance of prior experiences really comes into play when we talk about the concept of constructivism, or what's really happening in your brain, neuroconstructivism. That is that we have neural networks in our brain for basic and core concepts, and we build off of that. So what we know, our prior knowledge, gives us a scaffolding upon which we can build and learn even more complex things in the future. And this brings us to two basic premises. Number one is that, you know, learning occurs throughout the lifespan. You can and do learn until you die. Um, but it's fundamentally incorrect to think about learning as development being in parallel with age. It's actually more in parallel with prior experiences. So the greatest determinant of learning outcomes in the future is what you already know, what you can scaffold upon to build this new or more complex knowledge. Another important concept to take into consideration is that we tend to divide learning into formal and informal constructs. Your brain doesn't do this. Your brain just thinks it's learning. But we do have situations in which we go to school, for example, in a formal context uh, versus when we learn things informally. For example, when we go to uh, a summer camp and we learn some new soccer moves or when you go into the kitchen and you learn a new recipe with your, your parents there cooking or if you visit a museum. Those are informal learning contexts, and your brain's treating that all the same as if you were studying within a classroom structure. The difference has to do with uh, the whys of things. In general, you know, why do we learn anything, or why do we hope that people learn things in society? It's basically that we hope that they have an acquisition of different knowledge, skills, attitudes, values, beliefs that help people function within society. What's interesting though, in a formal context, we're always thinking about the teacher-student relationship, whereas in, informally, it's really what society can help the individual understand about his, his or her own place within the context of the community. And finally, what we do in formalized settings is that we tend to use a curriculum structure or we divide things by math class and English class and science, for example. And most recently, schools have taken on the role of guiding social emotional skills as well. But the what that happens in informal contexts is pretty much focused on an individual's personal interests and their personal formation, or it's to extend what they might have already learned within the formal context of schools. Within the formal structure of schools, the how also differs. Within schools, we have pedagogy and instruction and, and formal teaching structures. And within informal structures, it's basically experiential based. How do you learn about the world through the experiences that you might have? When does this occur? Uh, we formally decide that learning occurs within schools, pretty much kindergarten until you finish high school or you go to college. So perhaps three, four, five, six years of age, all the way until you're 18, maybe 24, 25 years old. But within the context of informal structures, it's really from the moment you are conceived until you die. Uh, informal learning occurs throughout the lifespan. And where learning occurs now has also become very, very much uh, flexible. Schools used to be in formal schoolhouses, so we had face-to-face -face instruction and that was it. We now have blended instruction as well as online formats in which people can learn. But in informal settings, this is extended even beyond that and can include things like uh, virtual writing groups or online museums or book clubs that you might have with your neighbors. So all of this is just to say that your brain isn't making any distinction between formal versus informal learning, except perhaps in the motivation it has to do things. As many of you might guess, you know, informal learning contexts tend to be um, a bit more self-motivated and a little bit more energetic than the things that happen within the formal school structures. And this leads us to the academic competencies that are achieved within school settings. All of this is to say that academic competencies are important, very important for school success, society success, but it's only one type of learning. And we define academic competencies as being the sum of the knowledge, skills, and attitudes that are needed in order to meet with that academic success. And we define knowledge itself as being those dates, facts, formulas, concepts, names, categories. Anything that's basically Googleable is a knowledge base competency. We also have skills, however, because it's not enough to just know that information. You have to be able to use and apply that information. So being able to do something with the knowledge that you've learned is also very important within school contexts. 
And finally, we have attitudinal information, uh, the values, uh, the personal importance we attribute to the information that's learned. Uh, very key and important idea, studies coming out now show that there's a big debate now on whether or not it's very important to have this aptitude versus your attitude. There's a couple of very important recent studies that show that your decision, for example, your choice to make the most of things, to buckle down, to have, to self-regulate, to focus yourself. This ability to self-regulate accounts for almost twice as much as innate intelligence in terms of student learning outcomes. So it's very important to take into consideration this attitudinal aspect of academic competencies. Now we want to turn to a connected idea. It's considering growth mindsets. Many of you might have heard this idea, but I just want to put this into the context of mind, brain, health, and education. The concept of a growth mindset is related to one of six principles that we have about human learning. And a principle is something that is true across all cultures, age groups, and independent of prior experience, which is very interesting, right? One of those principles is the brain is plastic. Basically, it's highly plastic, it's neuroplastic throughout the lifespan, and you can and do learn throughout the lifespan. So it's thanks to this plasticity that we can actually justify the concept of growth mindsets. And it's thanks to this principle that we understand that, again, your experiences in life, because your brain is plastic, creates the scaffolding upon which you can learn new things that all kids can and do learn. They might not learn at the same pace, but they can and do learn. And that learning is fluid and not fixed. And it's this last point, the fluidity of learning, that justifies the concept of, of a growth mindset. Somebody who has a growth mindset basically looks at failure as an opportunity to grow. I can learn anything I want to. Challenges help me grow. I like to try new things. This is very, very different. This is a mentality that says, you know what, I am not limited to my biology. I did not inherit genes that determine who I am. I can be more than my biology. This growth mindset is contrasted with somebody with a fixed mindset who thinks that, you know, failure is the limit of my abilities or I was just born this way. My dad's bad at math. I'm bad at math. Or the overall concept that my potential is predetermined by what I inherited. The main idea from Dweck's work is that students who believe that their intelligence could be developed, those who had a growth mindset, outperformed those who believe that intelligence was fixed. So just believing, just accepting, just buying into this idea of growth mindset, which we now can substantiate with neuroscience in the factual establishment of plasticity, is pretty exciting. So these are some of the ideas we want to talk about in Module 2. Looking forward to seeing you in class.